Hello, my name is Karen Lobel Freed. I'm an artist and author from Volcano, Hawaii. The objective of my work is to try and convince people of all ages to care about wildlife and want to help conserve it. Most people like birds. Birds unite people across lands, across seas, and birds provide a window into conservation. By showing their dependence on places and resources, birds can make ecological connections clear to us. I have found that art and stories are a great way to engage people and communicate about science, create connections with kids and within communities. Art and stories can excite people, spark interest in a visceral way to things that they might have had no previous experience with or interest in. I gather information from scientific papers, museum collections, from talking to scientists and working in the field, and then weave the facts into my storyline and art. In this talk, I'll share some of the things I've learned along the way and things I continue to learn about how to help people fall in love with seabirds and other wildlife. I am personally enthralled with Pacific seabirds. It was an obsession with albatrosses that first brought me to Midway Atoll. I was there to research for an iconic piece of art for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I was also there as a volunteer with the albatross census team, counting all the active nests. This was hatch year 2015, a record-breaking year for active nests. 19 of us counted over 666,000 Laysan albatross nests, over 28,000 black-footed nests. Spending so much time in the field, I got to observe behaviors of Laysan albatrosses and black-footed albatross and all kinds of other species. The art was entitled The Magic of Midway. <clears throat> My goal was to tell a visual story about this amazing place that most people either don't know about or will likely never get to experience. I wanted to try and give people such a strong sense of place that they feel an experience of it. I also wanted to make albatross the stars and make them irresistible, a loving couple that people could identify with. I also included the human history of the Midway story, the Battle of Midway, and the Hawaiian history, voyaging down Papahana Mokuakea, the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. The art also needed to look good on merchandise because Midway was going to make all kinds of swag for fundraising for the refuge. The Midway experience was so powerful. I had learned so much about albatross. I wanted to do something to tell their story. I wanted to, more of the public to learn about albatross. And I thought a book for young people might be a fun way to teach. Their lives are hidden from most of the public. With a book, I could tell the story with art and a narrative. While in the colony, I had noticed the things that make life harder and easier for albatross. I thought that storyline might work. What makes a perfect day for a nesting albatross? Remembering my objective, how do I get kids, families, and communities to care about wildlife? The thing about seabirds is they really are amazing. So I included as much of their truly astounding adaptations to blow away readers. A Perfect Day for an Albatross, written for ages four through eight, um, I wanted to make it personal and relatable, so I wrote about an individual named Malie, which means calm in Hawaiian. Malie is a nesting albatross on Midway Atoll. I wrote the story in first person from the perspective of Malie, walking a fine line between imagining what it would feel like to be an albatross while trying not to give her human emotions was tricky. I submitted the manuscript to Cornell Lab Publishing Group, 
and they were concerned about the book being anthropomorphic. So I rewrote the story in third person and it was amazing, it lost all of its spark. So we went back to fir the first person narrative and I worked closely with my wonderful editor at Cornell Lab and we got it just right. I wanted to weave facts into the, in a natural way into the storyline, especially those things about albatross that are so engaging to people, like their dance. I was able to tell about the importance of the dance for them in finding the perfect mate. I also saw lots of tumbling and painful landings, which is always difficult to watch, but there was something so cool about watching that perfect landing and I wanted to include that as well. Very satisfying. I also thought it was cool how albatross take off from the water the same way that they take off from land. So I included that as well. I tried to make the characters irresistible. I would shamelessly use cuteness to try and influence people. Seeing an albatross talk to his or her egg is such a delight that I knew that I had to include that. The nest switch is also really fun to observe. Um, when Malie's mate comes to relieve her and take over incubating duty, Malie doesn't want to go. I described in detail her resistance, her mate trying to push her off and she just doesn't want to budge. But finally she decides it's time to go. I tried to really capture all of the vivid sensory details. Here's an excerpt from that part of the story. The feeling is so strong to go, I don't even look back. I face into the wind and suddenly I am in forward motion, running, wings outstretched, tap, tap, tapping my feet on the flattened sand. Faster and faster I run, the wind, the lift, and then I'm in the air gliding and flapping a bit, but now I'm over the ocean and the wind lifts me. I soar. With reaching wings, I turn my body to one side and then tilt over to the other side, up on the wind, over the rolling swells, and then down I sweep into a water valley, the tips of my wing feathers skimming the surface. I catch the updraft and up into the sky I fly. I wanted to include how albatross feed and describe smelling food to teach about seabirds' fantastic sense of smell and see bioluminescent critters. There is so much that is alien and amazing about the way these seabirds live and their marine habitat that is foreign to us. I wanted to share these things and hopefully wow people. We included in the back of the book, educational pages, a find me section. Cornell Lab has QR codes with links to all about birds and albatross localizations and readers can see them in action on the bird cam that was on the nest in Kauai. We also share some of the threats to albatross followed by a ways we can help section. We wanted to empower readers young people and families by providing tools, things that they could do to be part of the solution. Vitika Holtheisen was incredibly helpful while I worked on A Perfect Day for an Albatross. She reviewed the manuscript and all of the art, checking for accuracy. Cornell Lab created an educational guide with lots of learning activities tailored for a specific age group that teachers could build into their curriculum. It was also fun and user-friendly, great for librarians, parents, and at-home learning. The educational guide can be downloaded for free from the Cornell Lab site and from my website. There was a lot of interest in using the Albatross book in educational ways. I partnered with Seymour Marine Discovery Center in Santa Cruz, California. And we created an interactive educational exhibit about the albatross for families. And it was up for nine months. We included the art from the book and descriptions of albatross lifestyle. 
a video loop created by Cornell Lab of the Kauai bird cam played through the exhibit, showing the whole nesting cycle of the Laysan albatross pair in about 10 minutes. We had a video of my block printing process, albatross puzzles and a stamping machine for printing black and white pages of art from the book so people could take them home and color them. After the show closed, this wonderful organization called Exhibit Envoy picked it up and made it into a traveling exhibit. So it was shown by some libraries and schools. And then when COVID hit, they created a virtual exhibit. So you could still read about albatross and learn and they had all kinds of cool interactive stuff. I was invited to do a couple of albatross presentations by the American Cetacean Society in California and uh, Breck Tyler and I teamed up and we talked about albatrosses from an artist and biologist perspective. And it was a lot of fun. Breck generously answered many of my seabird questions next when I worked with Pacific Beach Coalition on virtual albatross presentations for the public and for school classrooms around the world. We also provided online educational materials. For two years, Pacific Beach Coalition used the albatross as their mascot. Their theme was be a boss, help the albatross. And Cornell Lab partnered with New York Puzzle Company on this puzzle featuring the Midway art. It went full circle. Here on Midway from Hatch Year 2020 is the counting cohort finishing the albatross puzzle. It's a thousand pieces. I hear it's really, really difficult. And please don't hate me because I had nothing to do with that. Once upon a time, voices of the O'o birds fill the forests of Hawaii. Their ancestors arrived between 14 and 17 million years ago. The O'o were the very first Hawaiian birds of the forest. Although not a seabird story, I learned a lot working on my next book project, which helped me get better at telling science stories. I was asked by Conservation Council for Hawaii to create art for an educational poster about extinction. Marjorie Ziegler, executive director of CCH, complained that in Hawaii schools, kids only learn about extinction of the dinosaurs. But here in Hawaii, we have extinction happening all around us and Keiki, our kids, don't even know about it. At the time, board member Rick Barbosa, he named his son after the extinct O'o bird, hoping that one day Ka'o'o would understand the connection between birds and plants, animals and habitat. This story became the inspiration for our poster. I try to work from life, but with an extinct species, the best I could do was draw from the skins at Bishop Museum Vertebrate Zoology Department. I visited several times and studied the skins of the different O'o species in their connect collection. Early artists' renderings were also a helpful resource. Some of the four species of O'o were extinct before photography, so artists were the historians that gave us some idea of what the birds looked like in life. The poster featured the Hawaii O'o, and the back of the poster has loads of educational information. This poster was distributed to every school in Hawaii. So I felt the extinction story was an important one to share more widely, and there was potential for a storybook but I had some difficulty selling the idea to publishers. Most felt a story about extinction would be too depressing. Finally, University of Hawaii Press loved the story idea and agreed to publish the book in conservation in partnership with Conservation Council for Hawaii. We geared Manu, the boy who loved birds to six to nine-year-old readers and families. I aimed to write a hopeful and inspiring story about extinction and conservation through this boy's experience. I hoped young readers would identify with the boy and maybe a love for birds and a desire to help them would grow. 
So in the story, Manu is a young Hawaiian boy living in Honolulu, and he's a city boy. But he learns that there were once forests right where he lives, and they were filled with ho'o birds. Now there were only buildings and roads and lots of people. Manu loves all birds, but he learns that the birds around him are introduced species. He makes the connection between loss of habitat and no o'o birds, and how endemic species depend on endemic plants. Manu's name, Manu o'o mauloa, means may the o'o bird live on. It irks Manu that he's named after a bird that's extinct. He asks his dad, why am I named after a bird that's extinct? And if it's extinct, how can it live on? His dad says, someday, Manu, you'll know what your name means to you, which is a totally unsatisfactory answer to Manu. This drives him to want to learn everything he can about the o'o bird in the hopes that he'll understand the meaning of his name. As Manu learns about the o'o bird, as Manu learns about the old bird, we readers learn at the same time. He and his dad find the voice of the old online, and suddenly the bird comes alive to Manu. There's a link at the back of the book with OO vocalizations from the Macaulay Library so readers can hear for themselves. I was also able to introduce all kinds of cool facts about the OO through Manu's quest for knowledge, like how their tongues are shaped like straws with little brushes at the end for slurping up nectar from flowers. So how do you bring an extinct bird to life in a storybook? I worked closely with Thane Pratt, who did field work with what turned out to be the last Kauai O'o in the Alakai Swamp. Thane shared his field notebooks with me with descriptions of this bird's curious and feisty personality and his different types of movements and activities and vocalizations. Thane reviewed all of my sketches and helped refine my descriptions of the OO's behavior. Another important research was the naturalist R.L. Perkins' um, letters. He traveled in Hawaii from 1892 to 1901 collecting birds and insects for museums. His letters compiled by Neil Evan Hewis in his biography describe so much about O'o birds, where Perkins found them, their behaviors and their habitats. One trick that I employed in the story was using dream sequences to have Manu and the extinct bird be together. This gave me the freedom to weave in more information about the O'o diet, where they found their food, how they flew, and other behaviors. I used vivid language and lots of action, incorporating details that I learned from Thane and R.L. Perkins. Here's a section from the story. Manu gripped a branch with his clawed feet and stretched out his sleek, dark wings. He shook and fluffed out all his plumage. It felt good. He crouched, splaying his tail feathers and flashed the bright yellow feathers beneath his wings. Manu realized another O'o was perched right next to him, watching him with bright black eyes. The O'o leaped into the air, his long striped tail feathers flapping behind him. Suddenly, without even thinking, Manu jumped into the air. He was flying. He grabbed the wind with fast wing beats and quickly caught up to his friend. They banked around lush fern trees, spiraling over the mossy forest floor. They zipped through the sweet, damp air, taking turns chasing each other. Olapa trees, like hula dancers, waved their leaves gracefully as Manu and the bird flew by. Manu quickly plucked and swallowed an olapa berry then caught up to his friend to help chase smaller birds away from the lehu blossoms. They slurped up the sweet nectar. Manu thought it tasted like liquid candy. Feather work is a very important, beautiful and impressive Hawaiian cultural tradition 
with strong ties to power and to the gods. When Munner's class goes to the Bishop Museum and sees the feather work, he feels proud of his culture, but he feels some discomfort. So many feathers were used, and where are the oval birds now? Manu learns about the feather hunters of the old days who were talented, able to find the birds, could sting like the birds to attract them, knew how to capture them without injuring them, taking only the feathers needed, then releasing the birds. Only the yellow feathers of the o'o were used in feather work, and there were not many on each bird. But Manu dreams of how frightening and stressful the experience of being captured was for his friend, the o'o bird. Manu realizes he has never seen an endemic forest bird from Hawaii. As a birthday surprise, his parents bring Manu to Hawaii Island to see native birds. Manu memorizes their calls at the visitor center. And then he recognizes them on the trail. Through his dad's binoculars, Manu is thrilled to see an apapane and Io, the Hawaiian hawk, and here's an oma'o, the Hawaiian thrush. Manu visits Kea Ho Bird Conservation Center where endangered endemic forest birds are being raised to be released. There he sees the palila and the alala, the Hawaiian crow. Manu's family goes on a volunteer trip out planting koa trees on top of Mauna Kea. Manu sees a huge old koa tree in the distance, and while gazing down at the baby koa in his hands, he envisions the forest that might grow from the baby trees they're planting. He knows he's helping the forest birds, giving them back the habitat that they need. At the end of the story, Manu finally understands the meaning of his name, and he knows ways that he can make a difference for Hawaii's forest birds. We include lots of natural science information about the OO in the back matter. And there's also um, a cultural information and a glossary. There's a how can we help section with many ideas of things that we can do. New Age Press also published a Hawaiian language edition, which is being used now in several Hawaiian immersion schools. At this time, educators were contacting me about using Manu in the classroom. I was interested in educational guides to make it easy for teachers to bring science and conservation stories into the classroom. For Manu, the boy who loved birds, a team at UH Manoa in the College of Education's Curriculum Research and Development Group created activities around the book. And a colleague from Kamehameha School compiled these and her own ideas. She developed educational resources for Manu following three different standards for grades kindergarten through three. These educational guides to Manu, the boy who loved birds are available for free download on my website. Some of us have been lucky enough to hold a petrel, smell their deliciousness, but most people have no experience of petrels. How can we show these people how wonderful petrels are? Make them familiar to those who don't have any experience of them. The particular challenge of telling seabird stories is most people never see them and don't even know what they are. But I believe that stories and art can help people connect with seabirds. My latest book project is about the Uwau, the Hawaiian petrel. This story is told through a young Hawaiian girl's experience. Makani means wind in Hawaiian, and her parents gave her this name in honor of their love of seabirds. Makani learns that Uwa'u used to nest from the sea all the way up to the mountaintops, but now, mostly due to habitat loss and mammalian predation, only some Uwa'u still manage to nest in rough, high elevation terrain. They need our help. 
Makani's mom is a biologist working on a translocation program on Kauai, bringing chicks from their natural burrows in the mountains where they're threatened by feral cats and rats to an area close to the ocean where artificial burrows have been installed inside an area surrounded by a predator exclusion fence. This story is based on my own adventures researching the Uau. I was first introduced to Hawaiian petrels by my friend Megan Dalton. She was working with Pacific Rim Conservation and invited me to visit and volunteer with them to learn about the birds and the translocation program. The concept was exciting and hopeful to me. Over the years and many visits, Megan, Robbie Coley and Leilani Falk taught me so much. As the Uwa'u story grew, Lindsay Young helped me with my accuracy. Lindsay and Andre Rain from Kauai Seabird Recovery Project also gave me reading lists of papers on the Uwa'u. I'm deep, deeply grateful to Rachel Sprague from Pulama Vanai who gave me a visceral experience of Uwa'u in their nesting habitat. Rachel continues to support this book project with her photographs and updates on field work. Makani grew up on the Hawaiian island of Lanai. When she was small, she would hike with her mom and dad into the Hii colony on summer evenings. Here's an excerpt of Makani's experience from Finding Home, A Petrel's Journey. In the dark, at the top of the path, she lay back with her mom and dad on the springy uluhe. The ground hummed as uwa'u, deep in their burrows, murmured to one another. Makani's body vibrated from the voices of the seabirds. She felt a rush of air on her face from Uwa'u flying low and close. She shivered with excitement and wonder. Makani's dad handed her night vision goggles and before her eyes, the world of the Uwa'u came alive. Dark silhouettes circled the stars. Their undersides flashed white as Uwa'u flew by, flipping to dark as they soared in the other direction their black topsides a gleaming streak. Chasing one another, swooping, flapping, gliding, they called, ooh-woo, ooh-woo. Rachel emailed me one day about an uwa'u that had lost a parent. Pulama Lanai was doing supplemental feedings in the field with support from Pacific Rim Conservation and Hawaii Wildlife Center. This young, Petrel finally fledged successfully. I'm including this in situ story in Finding Home to show the many ways that humans are helping seabirds. On Hawaii Island, I met Charlotte Forbes Perry from the Pacific Cooperative Study Unit at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Charlotte invited me to go to the colony on Mauna Loa to collect game camera cards and search for new nests. I learned what clues to look for that revealed nest activities and had the thrilling experience of discovering a new nest. Yes, petrels are number one. I reviewed the camera card from a particular nest and felt like a voyeur. But looking through the captured photos and videos, I could piece together the lives of this uwa'u couple working so hard to prepare a good burrow nest for their coming egg, chick, and hopeful fledgling. I also wanted the story of rehabilitation to be part of Finding Home. I was in touch with Linda Elliott, Ray Okawa, and Juan Guerra from Hawaii Wildlife Center. An injured uwa'u was found waterlogged in a stream on Maui. The Hawaiian petrel arrived at Hawaii Wildlife Center with a left ulnar fracture, and Dr. Wan fixed the bird's broken wing. 
But while trying to climb the netting over the recovery pool, the uwa'u broke feathers on the same wing. Dr. Wan was able to repair the feathers and the uwa'u was finally released successfully. On Maui, Jay Penniman, Martin Fry, and Emily Severson from Maui Nui Seabird Recovery Project took me under their wings and into the largest uwa'u colony in Hawaii on the massive mountain Haleakala. Martin was incredibly encouraging and helpful and helped me make my trip happen in spite of COVID. We went at night to see the action on top of Haleakala <clears throat> through night vision binoculars and during the day to examine the habitat. Jay's passion was contagious and I appreciated his generosity with his knowledge that he's accumulated from so many years of researching Hawaiian petrels. Jay introduced me to Fern Duval. I learned so much from both of them. I was especially impressed by the incredible distances Ua'u travel to forage during nesting season and during off season, which Jay and Fern discovered through studies they did with the Ua'u using satellite and geolocator tags. I was also in contact with Kathleen Bailey, endangered wildlife biologist at Haleakala National Park. She introduced me to her daughter, a girl like Makani from the story, who grew up with Hawaiian petrels. In my story, I want to show that the characters recognize and appreciate that these wild birds are wild. The characters love the birds and admire them, and they want to help the birds stay alive and stay wild. In the back matter, I hope to edu help educate the public about seabird fallout season, turning off outdoor lights to help with that, and the places to contact if you find an injured bird. I'm also hoping that this story will enlighten young people about cats and their extreme threat to seabird survival. In the story, Makani has a pet cat named Eo after the great predator, the Hawaiian hawk. Eo is an indoor cat. Through Makani's talks to Eo, I hope to reach young readers. In the back matter, I'll include the facts about feral cats. Fingers crossed. In closing, things I've learned. A compelling story can teach a lot about science and conservation. Science is actually stories. A story with human characters can be more relatable. A relatable story can evoke compassion for non-human characters. Adults often read to kids, so I write for both at the same time. Don't dumb down a story for younger people. Kids, depending on their age, will understand different parts of the story in different ways and they will always ask a lot of questions. Make the story hopeful and give people the tools to be helpful. I've learned that my firsthand experience with animals in their environments makes for more authentic stories. Thank you to the biologists who have shared with me so much time and so many experiences. The work that you do is crucial to the survival of seabirds and it is so inspiring to me. I think it will inspire others. Fern Duval once said to me, Hawaiian petrels have superpower senses. To me, seabirds are superheroes, but survival for many species depends on us. I hope to open up the wonderful, amazing world of seabirds to kids, families, and communities and I hope that it makes a difference for the birds. Thank you.